I think generally what I've seen, which is positive, is you have a lot of core people, especially those who have been around for a long time, to really start asking those questions, be vocal about it, and then also stand firm, whereas before they might have not stood as firmly. And I think I'm, I'm included in that batch. And so hopefully the positives can outweigh the negatives and you just start to create a better uh, a kind of better social group of, of operators, hopefully, who are leaders in the space who then start to say, hey, like nefarious actors... Uh, short-term actors as well can play this game, but we're not going to play that game because we believe in the longevity of the space. And hopefully that starts to outshine and almost forces the hand for anyone who tries to play the short-term game. Hey everybody, Tanner here with Wagme Ventures. On today's episode, we have Jay Kirahashi Sofwe, VP Marketing at Ava Labs. For anyone who's new, this is the Wagme Ventures podcast where we do snapshots with interesting builders, founders, and investors from across Web3. Check out wagmeventures.io to learn more about the syndicate behind the podcast. But for now, let's get into it with Jay at Ava Labs. All right. What's up, everybody? This is the Wagme Ventures podcast. I'm Tanner, and I'm here today with Jay Kurahashi Sofwe, VP Marketing at Ava Labs. Jay, how are you doing today? What's going on? Doing well. Just going out of the... I feel like the pre-planning stages of the, the year, I feel like everyone in the space is probably going through that and, and really checking out what makes most sense for, for their respective attack plans effectively. So kind of glad we're out of that phase and, and just focusing on executing. So doing, doing well so far. Nice. That's great, man. I'm excited to chat here. I appreciate your time. I, I know this is definitely a busy season for everyone. So I'm pumped to get to dive a little bit more into Ava Labs and the cool work you guys are doing there. So maybe just by way of quick intro for anyone who, who isn't familiar with your work already I, I would love to just learn a little bit more about your professional story but kind of with a maybe a, an extra focus on sort of how it's intersected with your crypto journey I feel like oftentimes those are kind of in parallel stories for folks and so I'm, I'm curious how those came to converge at Ava Labs yeah definitely I, I think I have a very strange background I feel like most people who've been in the space probably have that same kind of read when you look look back at, at what's happened but yeah. when you go all the way back to kind of my origin story, if you will, for crypto, I, I just stumbled into early days of Bitcoin. That was really it. Nothing crazy there. I actually stumbled into marketing almost at the same time. I ran a music publication and grew that out to one of the largest music publications during that time. It was kind of the blog house era. If you, everyone remembers Hype Machine, it was kind of pre-Spotify. So just a different era. That was kind of the time I was able to, to grow that publication out. And we ended up getting about a million or so readers a year. And so that was really when I looked left and right and, and thought to myself, what was the main driver of success? Of course, there's a lot of things that I could identify, but one of the main components was was this category called marketing. So really went down that rabbit hole pretty quickly and, and worked at a bunch of different ad agencies, got a lot of great experience more from a structured perspective, but really most recently on the agency side, started to work at a, a pretty large agency called Ogilvy & Mather. This is where I was a consultant for brand and go-to-market strategy for mostly Fortune 500 fintech finance tech companies. And then this is where it starts to get a little bit more interesting from the crypto side. It's kind of that era 2015, 2016 where things were starting to heat up. Ethereum had just launched. And then all these massive companies were talking about blockchain as a technology. I happened to be one of the few people who knew anything that anything about that that category, I guess, and, and took that signal and ran with it and ended up actually starting up my own consultancy at Ogilvy focused on crypto brands, mostly like recently capitalized through the ICOs or even traditional funding. And so worked on that for a few years. And then at the end of my time there, ended up realizing being an operator, I think is where uh, my calling is most objectively, I guess, really thinking back at my experiences as an operator, again, stumbling into that. So maybe, hey, if we can be more purpose driven, and also knowing what I know now, perhaps I can find a little bit more success there. So I was hired as a head of marketing at a company called Airswap. It was a decentralized exchange, one of the earliest ones on the Ethereum blockchain and ran that team for about two years and change. We got acquired by consensus at the end um, in, of my term there in 2020. And then right as the acquisition went through, realized it might be a good time to really put my head up and, and figure out what's next. Scalability has always been a problem in general with blockchains, arguably still is, but 
at the time, it was even more so the case. And so realized, okay, perhaps building out an ecosystem, building or being a part of the solution for the scalability problem might be my next calling and subsequently joined Ava Labs as the first marketing hire in 2020. And we've grown a tremendous amount since then, have uh, achieved many, many different milestones. We're no longer this, I guess, like seed stage company that no one knows. And now we're definitely one of the the top contenders in the space. And so that's kind of where it all comes together. I would say it came, came together well before Ava Labs, but I would say it becomes more, I guess, solidified and reinforced in terms of my crypto slash marketing background. Super, super interesting. Okay. So definitely kind of early to a lot of these conversations and definitely well positioned to be doing what you're doing now with Ava Labs. So, you know, I'm going to assume all of our listeners are, are quite familiar with Ava Labs. Uh, you know, I, I think one thing that may be interesting would just be a quick Ava Labs 101 for anyone who's familiar with Avalanche, but not super familiar with maybe any of the broader work going on there. Mm-hmm. I'm curious, could you just talk about, you know, what's being built over there and, and kind of what is the purpose? What's it for? Yeah. So this this type of structure, I feel like is pretty commonplace now, but just for those that might not know, Avalabs is a team building uh, and improving upon Avalanche and its ecosystem. Generally speaking, early days, of course, we were one of the, the, the primary kind of teams, I guess, building upon the platform. And so when I was first hired, it was really about, hey, let's actually figure out how to build out this tech company, which builds upon builds upon the Avalanche platform, but also creates solutions that are generally in the category of Web3, I guess. And drilling down slightly a bit more, where we've focused a little bit more on is how do we actually, again, build on Avalanche or build Avalanche as a platform, but then also make that experience much better, simply put. So other solutions that we've put to market would be wallets so you can actually interact with the blockchain with dev focused tooling like sdks testing tools everything under the sun i would say on that side mostly on the infrastructure side and then more recently started to venture out into other areas that we've identified over the years which is most most recently would be ava cloud ava cloud is a fully managed blockchain solution think of it as a solution that was very popular during the web era where people, mostly those who aren't really too in, in deep with, with the tech technology and Web3 in this context, wouldn't have to actually go out and build out a full fully fledged engineering team. Instead, they can actually whip up blockchains or, or any other complex systems around blockchains without doing that, and then actually letting the team at AvaCloud manage the complexities effectively. So that's something that I've been focused on for the last year or so. And that actually came out as a as a product less than a year ago, around May, May last year. Very cool. Okay. Awesome. You know, so one thing I'm always curious about is really maybe the category of traps or or even just waste of time, right? Because I feel like it's in such a dynamic industry, there's always kind of trendy ways to a- acquire users or try to retain users. But I'm curious from your vantage point, like, what do you feel like is the biggest waste of time when marketing or positioning something like Ava Labs? Like, what, what traps have you noticed or navigated around that might be valuable for others to be aware of? Yeah, I think the main theme of marketing that many people fall into in crypto, especially, is thinking that the rule book is different, or, or at least the strategy book. I would say to kind of expand on that. It's mostly that marketing 101 is tried and true. It's been tried and true for 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 centuries, arguably, formally, and even even longer than that, informally. And so, if you understand those frameworks, we'll then adjust it to obviously the Web3 crypto niche, where your stakeholders are different, the channels in which they participate might may be different. But at the end of the day, like full funnel marketing strategies, executions are all more or less similar in, in the way you actually approach them. So. I think a common pitfall is thinking, again, because the rule book is different, that you have to totally reinvent the wheel and do something completely different, or maybe even divert from what is tried and true, which is what I've seen often. It's this kind of idea that because Telegram, Twitter, LinkedIn, even, and other channels are are pretty popular amongst most marketing channels, or sorry, most marketing strategies in the space, therefore, you have to follow that rule book. And that's not really the case, right? The case is more so that those companies have identified that that's where the the customer base is 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 actually playing in and existing in, and so therefore they need to be present there. And so I think it's kind of 
similar approach, but different in the sense that you should always test whether it's right for you effectively. Got it. Super helpful. Okay. Hey, everybody. Quick thing here. We're excited to announce Wagney Advisory, your home for all things fundraising, hiring, and partnerships. This is all about supercharging your project with the Wagney Network, consisting of over 20,000 executives, investors, and builders in crypto, all ready to come alongside your project to help it succeed. Get in touch at team at wagneyventures.io to learn more and figure out if Wagney Advisory is the right fit for your project. Now, let's get back to the show. So another thing I'm always curious about, and this is a bit of a recurring question on this podcast, but I'm always curious kind of two sides of the same coin, where one side might be kind of early challenges and the other one might be early surprises. And I think part of my curiosity or part of my interest in these questions is that I, I think that ultimately the ways that early challenges and surprises are kind of handled, I, I think that really kind of shapes the DNA of where things go, right? And so I'm curious if maybe just taking one of those sides, maybe maybe on the positive side first, like I'm curious in your tenure at Ava Labs, like what what's maybe one or two things that were positively surprising, maybe tailwinds you weren't expecting or or really any any variety here? And how did you and your team think about capitalizing on those? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think one that comes to mind is one of the earliest campaigns we ran here or major campaigns that we ran here, which was called Avalanche Rush. It was a liquidity mining program. And this was when a lot of other foundations, especially on the L1, L2 side, were also considering liquidity mining incentives. And it got so competitive to a certain point that all of a sudden we as a team, but also even the market started to second guess and question the strategy. Does it make sense if six out of the eight major L1s and L2s are providing millions of dollars of incentives for liquidity mining. Who actually wins that game outright? And one of the main parts of the strategy that we really fell back on was we believe that Avalanche had the or one of the best user experiences when it comes to, well, both developer, but also more importantly in this in, in line with this strategy, the retail trading side. And our strategy was really built around our strength, which is transaction finality as a platform. Transaction finality is something that we could claim as our true strength. No one else could get close to it. We could finalize transactions in under one second. And so therefore, the idea was that if the incentives were present to entice and attract traders, users to come in and use these applications, well, then the UX will be so profoundly, profoundly improved compared to other platforms in the space that more often than not, people will likely stick around because it's just, again, simply better UX. So this is obviously a playbook that most tech companies use. UX is, is kind of this tried and true thing. If you're able to create amazing UX, minimize friction, then you might have a successful product there. So that's what we ran into. And you obviously don't know how impactful it is until you run the campaign first and foremost, but then also see the results like years later, maybe, or even months later, I guess, as a, as a shorter term uh, milestone. And we ran that campaign in 2021. We went from, I think, like hundreds of thousands of dollars of TVL, if you were to use that as a measure. And in about a few months, I think we went to about 10, 15 billion, if I recall correctly. Um, of course, it was a ton of, ton of um, excitement around it. And so we weren't necessarily holding our breath. That would be the maintained, I guess, like floor, if you will. But Fast forward to 2024, right? You look at the TVL and the lowest amount that it had dropped denominated in terms of AVAX was about 50%. And so 50% comparatively to any, almost any other layer one blockchain or layer two blockchain was actually, I think, quite competitive, if not one of the leading metrics that you could see in the space. So that was an incredible outcome. It was kind of a combination of BD, like every single team was involved, BD, engineering, marketing. The founders were also obviously involved as well. And I think it really took a village to get to that point. And from our perspective, the, the the fun that we really had was really creating that narrative avalanche rush, this idea that you had the snowboarder kind of climbing down the mountain. It was a super epic kind of mini story that some people latched onto, but really was only a device to keep that cohesiveness available, I guess, throughout the campaign's life cycle. Yeah, I love that. Super interesting. So then maybe the flip side of the coin, like one or two early challenges. How, do, how have you and your team thought about early challenges and 
you know, maybe what is that? What did those conversations sound like? How did you guys process through those? Yeah, I have a few. I think one of the first ones was really the cold start problem. I think the cold start problem was quite difficult, actually. And and one that I also experienced back at Fluidity and AirSwap as well, where I think you underestimate how how difficult it is to to build networks, especially networks with two sides. And in crypto, usually, if you prop up some sort of blockchain or even an application, you usually have two different audience segments that you need to engage simultaneously while also growing them at a fairly aggressive rate simultaneously. And so for us, it was really about developers versus users. We started with users first, kind of almost out of necessity because we we came out of the ICO and, and a lot of the retail focus was directed towards us as a platform but realized, I think, very soon after that, well, users actually need applications to use and to interact with. We are not the hero of the story. The hero of the story is, in fact, the applications built upon us using Avalanche as a settlement layer. That kind of analogy we always hear in Web2, where it's like, you don't hear you know, Netflix or any of these major Web2 solutions saying Netflix powered by AWS, right? Like that's, that's never really happened. And so I think going back to that and then realizing, okay, let's start to see developers. But then again, there's a catch where just because you're getting, uh, getting attention of the developers and amassing attention of the developers doesn't mean you're also successful from a market sentiment perspective. And so I think we had to really adjust expectations, really honestly, like deal with a lot of upset retail investors, which lasted a year throughout this process. And, and, I think the biggest challenge was trying to convince them, hey, like we have a lot of things planned, but naturally we have NDAs that we signed. We cannot contractually let you know about these things. Plus it's not obviously advantageous because just because one subset of, of the community is is needing the news today or yesterday doesn't necessarily mean another subset is in line with that type of format either. And so you can't really win is kind of the the natural takeaway that we we ended up realizing. And I think at the end of the day, as a marketer or communications focused marketer, you just have to be transparent as much as you can and really just hear them out. And over the years, we've actually turned those averse individuals, if you will, or groups of individuals into super fans of ours, because I think they realized, hey, like we are here for the long term. And so are you guys. It's not just something that you can flip in a quarter or even months or days. And if you're there for that, then, you know, we're not going to play up to that type of strategy, but you're more than welcome to do that. But at the end of the day, that's not part of the, that's not part of our community strategy that we really started to double down on once we realized this. Love it. Super interesting. Okay. So, you know, one thing I noticed recently is Sports Illustrated. They recently announced that SI Tickets, which is, I guess, their their fan ticketing site, they've partnered to bring their NFT ticketing platform called Box Office to Avalanche. And so I was curious if you could talk a little bit about that partnership and how it came to fruition. And even maybe just generalizing out, like how, how does your team think about partnerships and bringing brands into Web3? Are there any kind of repeatable lessons there? Yeah. So with the Sports Illustrated deal, like with a lot of the deals that we've been getting, public and, and private as well, they've actually come mostly from the existing pool of of deals, if you will, within Web3. They're not necessarily, I feel like it's still like an 80-20% split of 80% existing deals that have kind of existed in the last two years, but either need to find a home or need to be rehomed. I think the 20% is more so like net new ideas that have been propped up in the last six to 12 months, which we're obviously going to see more of that, in my opinion, because of perhaps the market sentiments improving and, and conditions from a bearish perspective kind of loosening out a little bit as macros improve as well. And so when you ask about where we get these deals, it's a lot of the effort of the BD team, of course, but also the surrounding marketing and engineering teams and product teams as well that are doing a lot of the evangelism to kind of flex our technologies. Because at the end of the day, right, like these, let's let's pick those companies that need to be rehomed. And, and Sports Illustrated was one of them. They need to make those mistakes, of course, but also the other side needs to happen where they need to realize, realize that the solution is out there. And hopefully the third point is that you are part of the solution. And so I think we've done an incredible job to really showcase that our technology actually works really well and also works in line with some of the market, market signals that are out there. EVM compatible, scalable, lightweight nodes, all these different things. And so SI simply was, hey, they were using a technology that they thought was strong at one point or worked for them. It, for some reason, didn't work one way or another. It doesn't necessarily mean it's inferior tech by any means. It just didn't work there. It worked towards their use cases. 
And so then they kind of went shopping around and we were able to actually acquire that uh, deal quite nicely. And so what you're seeing there, I think, is again, just like testing and iterating, seeing especially those that have legacy, I guess, a legacy brand attached to it, which is more traditionally the Sports Illustrated brand. I think they're much more experimental in nature. So I think it's really, really important to land that sale and the execution of that sale the first time around. Otherwise, they aren't going to stick around for long. And I think you see that time and time again in the, in the industry. Super interesting. Okay. So I, I want to circle back on maybe one or two last questions on Neva Labs, but I'd love to maybe before that, just take a basically a step back and talk a little bit about some more general questions about the crypto space. And, you know, the first one I wanted to ask you is really just, what do you think crypto is getting right here in 2024? And then maybe in what ways do you think crypto could be doing better, especially from your vantage point of having kind of been through some cycles and you've, you've been in the space for quite some time. So this isn't, this wouldn't be a kind of short-term perspective you'd be bringing? Yeah, I think broadly, I don't know, there's so many thoughts, but I think broadly speaking, I think the industry can be much better at taking things slowly, perhaps. And I think it's a little bit counterintuitive because of the pacing of our industry and how fast innovation comes and goes. But it's you can see this from even the beginning of the Bitcoin Bitcoin kind of boom, I guess, or, or when Bitcoin started to grow past kind of the cypherpunk stage. You see a lot of different people and innovators jumping on the idea of exchanges, for example, then realized, hey, like self-custody might be a better route. Or if we do the full full shared custody approach, then we need a better solution like a multi-sig or better key management or something of, of the likes. And so I think you start to do this ebb, ebb and flow of the industry, right? And you would hope that the industry actually learns from itself. But for some reason, our industry doesn't learn as quickly as perhaps a lot of people would like, where you've had these exchange problems for a long time, uh, 10, 10 years plus. You've had some of these like bad actors who are raising a ton of crazy money or even making shady deals and people are still able to fund it. Like a good example is the Three Arrows guys. I don't really have too much of an opinion besides the fact that they defrauded their investors and their LPs. And they're still able to raise funds time and time again. That to me just doesn't make sense object, object, objectively, right? Maybe, you know, I could be open-minded and thinking, hey, like if you are reformed or you're able to work on something else that's totally not crypto related and you come back and say, hey, you're a changed person. Yeah, maybe maybe that could be okay, right? But it's a l the wound is a little bit fresh, I feel like, and, and the market right. is still funding it fully. So I don't know what the answer to that is, to be honest, of like what actually solves that problem. But I think generally what I've seen, which is positive, is you have a lot of core people, especially those who have been around for a long time, to really start asking those questions, be vocal about it, and then also stand firm, whereas before they might have not stood as firmly. And I think I'm, I'm included in that batch. And so hopefully the positives can outweigh the negatives and you just start to create a better social group of, of operators, hopefully, who are leaders in the space who then start to say, hey, like nefarious actors, short-term actors as well can play this game, but we're not going to play that game because we believe in the longevity of the space. And hopefully that starts to outshine and almost forces the hand for anyone who tries to play the short-term game. Yeah, I love that perspective, actually. I think it makes a ton of sense and it would be a, a great thing for the industry to evolve in that direction. You know, so another recurring question on this podcast is, if I were to ask you, the future of crypto is blank. How would you fill in the blank? Mm, yeah, that's a good that's a good one. I think I have two answers. Short term. So if it's the sh short term future of crypto, I think the short term future of crypto is continually improving infrastructure. I think people tend to find that because we have the L1s and L2s out, okay, great, the infrastructure problem is over or is soon to be over, we're going to move on to applications. I don't think we're quite there yet. And if you look at even like websites, for example, that infrastructure still arguably has changed. It's just maybe a little bit less less majorly than perhaps like early days of the internet, for example. Long term, I think long term, I'm thinking like 10 year horizon, maybe 10, 10, 15 year horizon. I think the future of crypto is less decentralized than you think is the fill in the blank. I remember like five, 10 years ago, probably more like five, five, seven years ago, actually, I used to personally optimize for a very, very, very decentralized future thinking, hey, this is actually the outcome we're all working towards. It makes so much more sense. 
you want to have a high degree of decentralization to minimize single point of failure, right? That's always been a narrative. But one other challenge of decentralization, as, as you know, and I think a lot of the listeners know as well, is it's really complicated to have coordination and, and coordination towards, towards a single point or a single direction. And so like with the advantages that you notice with centralized companies, there might be a middle ground. So instead of optimizing for, you know, ultra decentralization, I guess you might be optimizing for kind of a intermediate step first, which might be more of like the the Libra model from Facebook back in the day where they said, hey, we believe protocol decentralization is effectively 100 nodes because that's what they've defined it as. Whereas for Avalanche, we have a couple thousand and it's definitely way past that, but it's also not anywhere close to tens of thousands, for example. So I think it's I think that's where my sentiment comes from longer term. Super interesting thoughts. Okay. So Jay, maybe one or two last questions here for you. But first question would just be, what are you excited about? As you think maybe shorter term, next year, two years for Avalabs, like what kind of possibilities have got you most excited for the kind of work you guys are doing over there? Yeah, that's, that's, that's an interesting question, trying to figure out one. Actually, I think maybe touching on the Ava Cloud side a little bit. Like I said, with the, the previous question of infrastructure being an area that I think people will focus on, I think I'm, du- I'm going to double down on that a little bit and say, yes, the scope will be much more expansive even a year from now, but also more importantly, because of that ex- that potential and, and that ceiling kind of getting raised, I guess, over the next year and then even beyond that, there's also going to be a demand for simplifying that and streamlining streamlining that. And so there could be ways to streamline the product by just making it a better product. That's one option, right? But also there's another way to say, hey, we could actually start to tack on service offerings and we can actually start to, funny enough, put in humans in the middle of it just so those humans, those employees can act as experts in the room. And so not everyone has to understand how the car is made. Some people have to maybe understand how to maintain the car. Some people have to maybe understand how the car is made as well. But most people will only know need to know how to drive it and then maybe troubleshoot it on a basic level. Otherwise, they're going to reach back out to the, the subject matter experts when it comes to some of the more intricate topics. And so Ava Cloud, like I said earlier in the podcast, is a fully managed blockchain service. We bundle all these different services, APIs, RPCs, tooling that any developer would need, and then just really managing blockchain infrastructure for you. And so there's major companies like Deloitte, naming one of them, SK Planet from, from Korea, Honta from, from Japan. All these companies are trying to dive in headfirst, more or less, into this, this industry but again, like don't want to deal with the institutional knowledge that we know of Avalanche, but also just stressing out about it day to day. Are the nodes up? Are the nodes actually processing transactions properly? If there's a major upgrade on the Avalanche side, are they able to update the nodes effectively without, with, while minimizing downtime and any issues? All those questions and more are now offloaded to the team at Ava Cloud. So Super excited about not only Avacloud, of course, but just any other product that's able to potentially bridge that gap even more from those who are very distant from our industry and then those who aren't. And I think if we all as an industry continue to push push those boundaries effectively, I think we'll be at a much better place for, for the users that end up wanting to use it at the end of the day. Love it. Jay, one last question here for you. What is your team working on right now? And what's the best way for people to follow along on the journey? Yeah, so broadly speaking, so I obviously touched on, on Ava Cloud a little bit, but broadly speaking on the Avalanche side, there's a ton of different things that we're working on. But some important things would be on the gaming side, on the art side, DeFi has always been humming along quite nicely. Institutions as well has really been picking up recently. All these verticals were still pushing very aggressively. Now, what's underpinning this all are subnets as our distinct scalability solution. But then also coming soon is interoperability. Interoperability, I would see, I would say is the final piece, the final leg of the journey from, from kind of this foundational segment of Avalanche. So if anyone's interested in learning about Avalanche, you could go to avax.network. AVX is the token, so it's really easy to remember. And then if you're interested in Ava Cloud, as I mentioned before, 
avacloud.io is a, is a perfect place to start. And if there's any questions, of course, I'm, I'm on Twitter as well. Feel free to reach out. I'm happy to either address the questions myself or, or route, route, route you guys to someone on my team who can help better. Perfect. Jay, thank you so much for your time. Super interesting stuff. And I'm excited to keep following along the progress myself and really inspirational how you're thinking about these things. So again, appreciate your time and hope your week uh, continues well here. Yeah, appreciate the time too. Thanks again, Tanner. Okay, take care. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the episode, go ahead and maybe give us a good five-star rating and subscribe wherever you're getting your podcasts so you can get all the latest conversations with the most interesting crypto founders, investors, and builders from across the world. Thanks so much. Have a good one.